Um, we'll get things kicked off here. Good morning. I think I'm the only one who brought coffee. Are you all awake? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. One, one fellow person. Okay. Excellent. Ah, two. Okay. Okay. There is a majority, uh, a, beginning, a beginning majority here. Okay. So I'm Johannes. Um, to um, uh, organizationally speaking, so the password, Wi Fi password is over there. I don't know whether anybody can get other power in the floor. I failed when I tried, uh, in case you brought laptops. Then um, we are being streamed on YouTube, I'm told. Uh, I do not know exactly in which directions all these microphones and cameras are going, but if for some reason you're not comfortable uh, being streamed, you should maybe hide somewhere in the back of the room. Then also, I don't actually have a presentation. <coughs> and uh, that wasn't intended to be. Personally, I hate presentations because it implies something. And what it implies is the person in front somehow has all the answers and everybody else has only the ability to listen to them and believe them. Uh, I think we all about equally smart in this room. And so I'd much rather have a conversation rather than a presentation. So I brought some people that are hopefully going to help me uh, with, uh, hopefully help, are going to help me with uh, organizing this um, conversation a little. But the idea is to make it as interactive as you can, can make it. I haven't actually done this in an audience like this, but we'll see how it works out. So here's the, the subject. Let's build our own Internet of Things. And um, let me um, just uh, maybe uh, to get some idea of who is actually in the audience. I do see that Kathy is not the only person anymore who is female. It is good. <laughs> there are very few other <laughs> people in the room, but some that's good. Who has something that is roughly an IoT device in the house? Okay, that's most of them. How, wh wh what kind of ty devices do you guys have? Is that something that is the usual stuff like the Nest thermostat that is hermetically packaged and you have no idea what's happening inside? Who has that kind of stuff in the house? Ah, okay. Who has built something their own? All right, it's about half, half. That's good. Okay, okay. Interesting. Okay. So just, just to, um, to motivate this a little here, is uh, you probably all saw this particular cartoon that went around a little while ago. Unfortunately, it's all too true, right? It is very strange to me that somehow we buying products that we put into our houses that notify some other dude, like Google, what's happening in our houses before they notify us. What, what, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> I think there's a lot of wrong with this picture. Go ahead. I happily surrendered to the Google Empire because the the smart smart thermostat that I previously had sucked. I, it was terrible. The 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 Nest is a dream, and it it stays out of my way, and it just. Sorry, it just works. Exactly. So, so there's, you know, there's pros and cons for all of these kinds of things. But personally, I think, you know, as, as Bruce Darling, the, the, the science fiction guy, uh, said at some point, uh, the IoT is, all, is neither about the Internet nor about things. It's about the control of property. Um, and I think that's what it boils down to. So if there is going to be some kind of Internet of Things that is more owned by the users, I call this indie IoT. This is why it calls that subline. It's independent rather than some overload in the cloud, it will come out of, a, out of a group like us. You know, we're going to have to build it because average people are not. That's the conversation I want to have. So, quick, uh, quick introductions. Kathy, would you like to go first? Who are you? Why are you here? Hi, my name is Kathy Jory, and I'm fortunate enough to have joined Mozilla about a year and a half ago. And Mozilla is a nonprofit foundation that has the corporation that builds Firefox, and the majority of the engineering is devoted to Firefox. But there's a small team like R&D-ish uh, called Emerging Technologies. And within Emerging Technology, you have mixed reality and some voice, deep speech, common voice, and some um, Rust pro programming language, AV1 royalty-free codecs, and IoT. And I'm on the IoT project team, somewhat as a sort of strategic product person and also more and more an evangelist because I love to play. I've been in the semiconductor microcontrollers and Wi-Fi routers and things like that. And so Mozilla, as you probably may not know, if you go to iot.mozilla.org, we've been working on this project now for uh, almost two years and um, 
we have a release for a Raspberry Pi so that you can turn it into a private um, gateway. So it feeds into the independent IoT. It's just going to be both boxes. So our goal is to allow you to have the data center of your smart home in your house and you own and control that data and decide who to OAuth connections to the cloud with. I mean, I'm not, I'm not discouraging like the Nest models where there's a vertical silo that makes sense and industrial IoT has some of these specific silos. But what I like is I can buy a Samsung's smart button and I can turn on my IKEA outlet, you know, and I can, so our, basically the three paradigms of our project are privacy, security, and interoperability. And we are, we've been working with the W3C's Web of Things interest group. Who, who knows uh, anything about the Web of Things? Who has heard the term Web of Things? Basically bringing that, doesn't matter what's going on, how the IoT data gets there or where it gets, but you somehow get it onto a network. Eventually it gets to an IP layer so you can create a web layer on top of it. And it's a JSON description of like the on-off property and the light property, uh, uh, actions, like a toggle action or a fade action, and then events like alarms and things like that. So that's that's basically. I, I, before, give, give me one second. Yeah, I, I would care. like to uh, yeah, spend sorry. a very short, <laughs> I, I apologize, I'm going to spend a very short amount of time on this gentleman because he says he lost his voice last <laughs> night, so he can say very little. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I can talk a little bit. Oh. Uh, my name is Christian Paul, I'm an IoT hobbyist from Vancouver, BC. Uh, I'm also a web developer, which is really handy if you use something like a web of things because you can then interact with everything you know, with the usual interfaces of HTTP. Um, and yeah, I uh, have a couple of devices uh, on my own uh, with the gateway actually from Mozilla. Um, I've been running that for a year and uh, also programming my, my own things um, with that and we'll bring that experience a little bit into the conversation. Let me just add, add a word about myself. So I have a little company called Indie Computing. We're shipping home servers. Uh, and in fact, we're going to give um, a couple away uh, during the raffle. Um, currently, they run Nextcloud, which is basically a, a Dropbox alternative that you run in your own, um, in your own home, uh, all open source, uh, pre-installed and pre-configured. So it becomes a little easier for those among us who like to have the data at home to actually do that at home. And uh, the idea is that over time, more and more software that should really run in our homes and hardware to control can end, end up on those home servers, such as the Mozilla Gateway for IoT and other kinds of things. I think it's a logical integration point that we don't have today because uh, we have to send everything to somebody else's cloud. And, and can I just say really sure. quickly that when I was doing a hands-on workshop at IoT Fuse in Minneapolis the two days ago, this didn't cut it. So I really want one of your Intel notebooks <laughs> for running this software instead. Okay, so you had a comment. Oh yeah, no, I was just curious if it's uh, restricted to just um, Wi-Fi or you know just standard internet, or does it support multiple protocols like so Bluetooth and all yeah, the other? Yeah, so this things. has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on board. Most routers are only Wi-Fi, but they're starting to come with Bluetooth, and we're targeting. But from a Mozilla angle, we really want to target like a Wi-Fi router so that we can uh, expose port 443 directly. Like you have an HTTPS access from the outside in. Right now we have to run a tunneling service to get in through your firewall. If you're right on the edge of the router, then you can expose port 443 directly. This is a Zigbee dongle. And you can buy similar things for Z-Way. And you can, this is really cool. Um, I love this uh, idea. Basically, this is a 433 megahertz stackable on top of an ESP32, and then all of these cheap. Uh, Th does everybody know what an ESP32 is? No. Uh, okay. So, so here, here's, so here's how it goes. Okay. Nobody knows everything. Almost nobody knows anything. Okay. <laughs> Raise your hand when somebody says something you don't understand. Uh, we want to yeah. understand you. So can you say like uh, one sentence so, about the ESP32? Yeah. So what I'm trying to answer is there's tons of radio protocols. It doesn't really matter. But things like Zigbee and Z-Wave and 433 megahertz, you have to bridge to an IP layer. So mm -hmm. what you do, you can either, this is the concept of an external bridge. I have a 433 megahertz antenna that talks 
and, and it's plugged into something that has Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi talks back to the gateway. The 433 megahertz talks to these guys, and then suddenly I have just my, through my web browser, I can control these outlets, even though they were never built as IoT devices. They are literally local remote control devices, but the protocols are open source, and so there's these libraries, and you run the Arduino framework, and you can control this. And so buying packs of these is way cheaper than buying, <coughs> well, actually the IKEA one is $9.99, so that's a big but basically, Web of Things doesn't care what your underlying protocols are. So, so I don't have to buy the light bulb with the Wi-Fi. No. So, so, so I think the interesting thing to say about this is that, that it, maybe we should, we, we should spend like a minute on this Web of Thing idea, uh, which, because about half the people didn't really know what the idea was um, very much. I think it's worthwhile understanding uh, whether you agree or disagree with it at the end of it. So if you think back, those of us, many of us in the room are old enough to remember the beginnings of the Web. What was the new thing about the web? I mean, we had e uh, AOL and we had all these people at the time, CompuServe and all that stuff at the time. What was new? It was new that anybody could set up a server and anybody could download a piece of uh, free piece of software and anybody could connect anybody, right? And the f whether there was a uh, deck alpha underneath or there was sun underneath or a next underneath or all these things and it was completely irrelevant. You just point and, uh, and what, whatever native protocols they spoke was not relevant either. That's the thing that created the explosion, all right? Now, the idea with the Web of Things on a very high level is to do the same thing for the IoT. Today, if you buy an IoT device at your favorite retailer, what you get is something that is the opposite. It's tied into some, something. It's tied into a particular wireless protocol, it's tied into a particular gateway, it's tied into a particular cloud. It's all you know, the equivalent of what we had before the Web. And so the Web of Things idea is that you could raise the abstraction layer to a common way of talking to each other in a decentralized fashion. That would be IP. So whatever the, the underlying protocol is, whether it's Bluetooth or Zigbee or any, any what we know today or what we invent in the future, you raise it to a common layer and then you talk HTTP to it locally on an effort. This is a very powerful idea. Right? So if you had every sen any sensor in, the, in your home, for example, any actuator, you could talk to it with HTTP, that'd be cool. Right? Now the question is, what would you say? How do they interact with each other? You know, not everything can, I mean, what exactly does it mean to, to talk HTTP? You have to have standards around or formats around how, how to do that. Um, but uh, as, as Cathy said, you could uh, add some metadata, which these guys did and the W3C has, uh, has done. There's a metadata around it so you can discover, oh, this is a thermometer and this is the resolution and this is what you can do. And this is a switch and you know, it can do these kinds of things. And you can discover that and once you discover that, you can do smart things around it. Does that make sense? Right? Um, now, the, and there's a bunch of implementations from all sorts of people, and Mozilla has done it. It's great that Mozilla does that, uh, that kind of stuff, even if we only really know it about the browser. And the promise is, from my perspective, why this is exciting, is the promise is that one day I could go into the Home Depot or some place that sells IoT de devices, and I pick one up, and I put it on my home network, I add it to the Wi-Fi, that seems to be the common denominator, but that's all I need to do in terms of setup. No funny cloud, no strange usernames and passwords, no vendor silos, no nothing. It just plugs in like any, like if I plug up a toaster, I can plug it into an outlet and nobody thinks that maybe, you know, it won't work in the, in the power outlet, right? Can we have the same thing uh, for, for higher level data transfer protocols for IoT related stuff? That's, that's the idea. I think it's very powerful. Now there's a lot of unsolved things around it I should mention too. Security is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so yeah, yeah, my, my, my example is, well, you know, okay, my front door lock, right? Could be HTTP, that sounds cool. <laughs> HTTP post, click. <laughs> uh, maybe not. <laughs> so, driving down the street, opening all the front doors. <laughs> exactly. So, there is work to be done, okay? Uh, and some, some of the things exist, and some of them don't exist yet. Uh, I don't think the security thing has been sorted out to the extent it needs to. Um, but, um, you know, it's innovation. We didn't have, you know, uh, security in HTTP 1.0 either. Yeah. It's, it's a gra I think of it as a granular level of security. Right now, there's, there's probably at least two layers, like the lock and the unlock browser, like HTTP, HTTPS. So my 433 megahertz, like, I can, uh, I can already, if you buy these things, I can already go to somebody else's house and use my controller to talk to it, because they're, their standard codes, right? So this is already an insecure device, and so you would see it as an unlocked type of thing. 
a locked thing, you know, your front door, you wouldn't want to use open codes, and you'd have to have some sort of encrypted key exchange for devices like that. But then as a user, I want to see in my browser interface the difference between the two. And ultimately, that's another reason to be on routers. You know, I can, I'd have some sort of lock, unlock, and when I provision it, there are some things coming that if companies I've talked to that sound encouraging to me. There's something that they can actually do fingerprinting of wireless devices in the RF realm that they're actually like snowflakes. They can do some sort of training and, and machine learning for the RF characteristics of the device and no, no two devices are identical. And so then you can, if somebody is trying to pretend to be one of your devices and communicate with you, you're like, and it doesn't match the fingerprint that Snowflake, that's an out-of-band way of detecting devices. Even if there's an encrypted link that's like another check. It's like two-factor authentication. Yeah. Can you remotely control them from, uh, if you keep your everything at home yeah. and log in from another, log in from somewhere else, yeah. could you control it? everything from somewhere Yeah, else. so from here, mm -hmm. this is my desk in Mountain View, mm -hmm. and um, all my stuff here, I can open up my desk cam view. So this is a tunnel that we're running because it's behind a corporate firewall. And you see a bunch of junk on my desk. <laughs> but let me just show you that if I go in here and uh, turn on this light, I like to use this one because it's very pinky and it's, it's obvious when I, when I click the camera again, you'll be able to see it. Uh, step Step one of setting up one of these Mozilla gateways is getting it on a network. Step two is adding an HTTPS certificate. So it's a light pink, but so you can see that light is on right now. So uh, right. So and, and so that is your outside access is always blocked. Only your, and then step three is your first user account. Only you can log in to your house from wherever you are. Okay. From the um, gateway to the server, what is the preferred communication? Is it MQTT or um, post HTTPS so, or um, so, SOAP or what? So all sorts of things can be done, right? In the Web of Things world, it's supposed to be web protocols only. The core communication at, at protocol the high, at, is... At the, at the web developer layer, yes. it's web communications. But how that sensor or actuator data gets to the network layer doesn't matter. You can do anything you want. Because unless you're the one who's implementing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I see you have a, what is that, like a Raspberry Pi? This is a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, and then you have a um, ESP8266 talking to your 433 million devices. Right, so and that's, that would, a, that's a Wi-Fi bridge. Yeah, the, the Wi-Fi bridge would talk to your um, your device or the, the NUC. And, exactly. And um, it's that communication, I'm wondering what it is. Is it MQTT or just regular? Um, HTTPS, not from uh, the device. So to the I actually programmed the web, uh, the ESP32 using Arduino and publishing the web thing API data. And if you do MDNS, then the gateway will automatically discover it. There's a little plus sign. When I um, click down here, this little plus, it scans for devices. It will see Zigbee, Z Wave. And I have virtual devices here. It shows the list of devices. You change a name, you save it, and, and boom. So with the ESP32, it's actually just like a commercial device. It just see it. It's doing MDNS. If it's not doing MDNS, even a Wi-Fi device is a native web thing. Is that as long as it's publishing this little JSON structure, um, you can go to its <coughs> IP address. It's just a it's just a URL. Th does everybody know what MDNS is? Um, some some nods. Okay, Basically, so you know. Oh, yeah. good. A, a web thing is a URL, and you can parse those data. So this interface sees it <coughs> directly as a web thing. It's not MQTT. It's not Zigbee is a different protocol. Z-Way is a different protocol. You could do MQTT, but there's no standard for what the data is behind it. You'd run then an MQTT server here. We have right. an add-on framework, and that's the other thing that um, man, I should have just. So let me step back one more time. So, so think of the engineering problem. If you want to take an arbitrary device and you want to add it into an existing network, right? And the arbitrary device comes from an arbitrary vendor. Um, well, <coughs> how, how does this work? Okay, you can't make any assumptions about what's set up already, right? It has to be all auto discovered somehow. And M uh, MDNS came from, I believe, Apple uh, when they had the problem of having uh, gotten rid of Apple Talk and having to discover printers on the network that you just added to the network, and now you want to print, and the printer's on there without setting any app on the network. How do you do that? 
All right, so they came up with is a protocol where basically the, the printer publishes a pa packet onto the network. It just broadcasts this and say, I'm here. You know, I'm, I'm a printer. And find out more uh, if you go to this particular IP address or this particular port. Okay, and that's that's became open source, uh, and they turned into a, a MDNS and some versions around it. But that's that's the reason why your iPhone can discover a printer on a network uh, because it's decentralized discovery. So basically, what the uh, what Web of Things is um, um, basically to, it takes it takes this protocol and says we can discover other kinds of things, right? We can discover thermometers and we can discover all of these kinds of things. They basically put every now and then put a packet onto the uh, on the network and say there's something here. That's why it takes a little while before your printer shows up in the dialogue. It gets published every once, once in a while, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then there is a, I was hoping that uh, Peter Hardy from Marble was going to be here, but he said something about, uh, about customers and software not ready and having to release things and they're very busy and you know, these kinds of things that software developers really I don't understand this, right? <laughs> but anyway, so the point being, uh, so they have a very interesting um, uh, pr uh, extension to MDNS by which they actually publish sensor data directly in the MDNS advertisement. So if you have a sensor, for example, uh, like a thermometer, not only does it say, here I'm a thermometer, but it also says, by the way, my temperature is such and such. And so it publishes this regularly on the network, which is very cool because now you can say, write some code and says, I'm just going to listen to these events. And these, this kind of code is built into all of the major operating systems these days, uh, uh, like Avahi on, on, on Linux. And you just basically listen to this event, and it tells you all the temperatures that, uh, that happen on your network uh, without any, ha you having to do anything other than just run the Avahi, um, I forgot what it's called, Avahi scan, or I forgot what the exact command is uh, uh, on Linux. But basically, it just pr provides one event after the next. And that's, I think, an incredible innovation tool. You know, going back to the point about MQTT and all of this, is in, in the MQTT world, you would have to set it up. Right? There is now a server you need to have, an MQTT server somewhere, which you don't know that you have, and you just have arbitrary devices on a network. Then you have to have a credential for that service. Otherwise, you know, anybody can connect to anything. Uh, and then you have to, then there's a bunch of protocol levels in the middle uh, that are missing. So, so um, um, a lot of things can be done, but if you want to have this decentralized, plug everything in the network, and it just works, then I think MDNS plus some HTTP-based discovery uh, is actually very powerful. But, but I would add to that that you know the indie way is that we're not going to force all device makers to pick one protocol or one standard of the radio or anything. And so that's where, uh, so the web of things is this overarching standard to have web developers everywhere <coughs> participate with Internet of Things, just like when they open up all the sensors and and things of a phone and app developers could suddenly create all these creative apps that the phone makers weren't <coughs> thinking of. That's what we want with Web of Things. We want applications of analyzing data and doing data analytics or doing, or, or our rules engine is super cool. I can set up rules for if this and this or this or this happens, then do that and that. And it's just built right in the interface. But bridging those things is still goes back to what, what we call the add-ons framework. And this is independent of the core gateway and this is where the community comes in, because people have built add-ons for um, other devices if they want to use that device. So there's, if you click the little plus, you'll see the name of the add-on, who wrote it, and what the license is. And they're all open source right now. But you know, TP-Link, Broadlink, Chromecast, um, there's a date time adapter that just makes rules more interesting. It's not really a real thing. Email sending is also just a uh, eTech City, Eufy, a flick button, generic sensor. So there's all these, even the home kit, you know, application protocol. So instead of bridging the, all these Samsung and Ikea to their own hub, you bring it just to one hub and you have one user interface that shows all the devices together and then the rules I can make mix and match. That's the interoperability part. So should, should that's we quickly mention that you have a session tomorrow on that? I, I do. I can show you all this in real time at 9.30 session tomorrow at 9 30. I have a one hour tutorial so I can show this stuff live. Hi. So Christian, you have a session. <coughs> right? oh, yeah. When uh, is that and what is it about? Uh, it's tomorrow at 10 45 and it will be about the Web of Things API and more the protocol and yeah. like being the web developer and how can you take advantage of IoT data once it's defined yeah. in a standard way. So other than it being much easier to set up and use, what's the difference between Mozilla's IoT things and personal assistant. Uh, oh, like home assistant? Oh, is a home assistant? Yes. Yeah, home <laughs> assistant, open hat, 
uh, d uh, the one that starts with a D. Um, those are all, we applaud any open source, private, indie computing way of doing private smart homes. So we're the only ones that are, we, we've adopted the W3C Web of Things framework as the, as the layer of connecting all these things. And um, I would say feedback I've had of people have used those and ours. I haven't used all those others, but I've, I've, people have shown me theirs. Um, Home Assistant has some like YAML and configuration stuff you have to learn. And the ours, like already my mom is running it in the house and my from yeah. relatives I set it up for, so. Yours is much easier to set up. I'm still trying to. <laughs> so. Uh, but we want, I mean, I even want Samsung Smart Things on their hub or home assistant. I talked to Paulus. We want them to embrace the web of things so that these things would be interoperable between them. H has anyone used some of those other ones? Anyone running them? Yeah, which one? Home assistant. And I tried open hab and open hab too as well. Yeah. I just, my brain and I'm just going with home assistant. Yeah, home assistant. Home assistant. So our, the other reason that our, because they started it before I got to Mozilla, the reason they didn't pick one of the existing ones was they wanted a little bit more flexibility in the programming environment. So our core right now is written in Node.js, so that web, the web GUI is really easy to do. We'd really like to rewrite that in Rust, uh, the, the, the core for Wi-Fi routers and stuff, for more reliability in a smaller footprint. Very but then it becomes harder for to maintain the course and fewer developers who will help you work on that. But the add-ons framework, they're written in Python and Rust and Node and Java and JavaScript and that was sort of the other reason that they did this add-on framework for the lightweight core and then the add-ons can be in whatever programming language you want to use to bring your thing onto the net, especially if you're building on your own, you know, on your own and you need one of these add-on adapters. People have written uh, one of our other guys, the other really interesting thing to me is I have a USB speaker microphone plugged into mine and I've used one of our speech engineers made a voice controller add-on using uh, some open source libraries plus his own glue code. I have local wake word that I create. I just type in the configuration of the add-on. During the Christmas holidays, my wake word is Santa Claus. And then I could say turn on, you know, Santa Claus, dink, turn on the Christmas tree lights. <coughs> these little outlets plugged in. I, mean, I thought it was pretty cool. My family kind of laughed at me. But <laughs> private, so private voice control, that those voice, uh, because the language model is small enough, it doesn't have to go to the club. Yeah. But you know, there's inter there's interesting reasons why this kind of local control is interesting. All right, as a geeks, we sometimes we think it's a good architectural pattern, but I think there's all sorts of reasons. Privacy being one of them, um, and then we, we come back to this one. But there's others. Um, remember what happened to the uh, Revolve? It was uh, yeah. thing all open source, and Google bought it. You know who knows the story? Revolve. Nobody. Business, uh, all devices are all yeah. useless. So but apparently. Um, uh, the lows is their offering is right. So the, the, the short version was that um, there there are so many projects uh, that are basically, in spite of being uh, being fairly open, uh, at some point they go away. Or right? if they if they require a cloud service <laughs> and somebody turns off that cloud service, then your then you're device dead. is ripped. And it also happens if a if the company is bought by Google and you would sort of think they would take care of a customer, but no, turned off. Oh, it doesn't work anymore. Sorry. Um, you know, here's what is getting really interesting for me from a business perspective, which is, imagine for a second, um, we, uh, what, it comes to pass what the Cisco's and all of those people of the world tell us about hundreds and whatever of uh, connected devices in our <coughs> homes. Think of your home for a second, right? It has now all hundreds of devices in there. Well, what, for example, it might have, let's say, glass breakage sensors or moisture sensors. If your window is open and it rains, you tell about, you know, these kinds of things. Now, I replaced the windows uh, of my house recently. I believe they were about 30 years old when I replaced them. So if I were to buy a window, some future window that had some kind of moisture sensor in it, the lifetime, right, that I need to have for this thing is about 30 years. And I'm sure people have older windows than that, right? Now, practically speaking, which window would you go to today and buy a, something from where you would want to be rather confident that it still works 30 years from now? 
I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, <laughs> the very question makes no sense. Now, how do we get there? How, how could we possibly have products that are built into our houses that are old or into our streets? You know, some of the stuff gets buried underneath the asphalt in our streets, right? How, how, how is it possible that this still works 30 years or 50 years in the future? And I think the only answer is that it has to be open in a sense that when some vendor goes out of business, somebody else can take over without anybody's permission. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's just not going to happen. Now, uh, and it has to be common protocols of some kind. And I think what you end up being is it will have to be probably IP rather than any other protocol because the likelihood that IP survives is just a lot higher than that any other protocol survives because it's just much more broadly de deployed. Right? And it has to be open and discoverable, uh, and it has to be as open source as possible. Right? Because if this thing has a security f uh, problem you know, 15 years down the road, I mean, what does that mean? You have to turn off your house now because you can't fix it anymore because the vendors have gone away and the source code has disappeared? <coughs> I mean, it has to be open source and has to be open protocol. We have to build this. Uh, and if so, then there is a market that is much, much larger than the market in IoT today because people like me would actually be willing to shell out some money for <laughs> these IoT-enabled windows. You know, before that problem of longevity is solved, I will not shell out any money. I mean, it would be insane. I, one, one, of the, one of the things in, in the, the trade-off I made with the Nest thermostat was that they're not, for, for having something that's embedded in your house yeah. that's, that's, that is life safety issues, for example, like a thermostat, I don't want some science project, you know, that may or may not run my furnace full time and oh, oh, overheat and the house, yeah. et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's why we need all of you to embrace industry to, you can still have, like, what, what, I, would, what I want from Google, and I actually went to Nest, and I had former colleagues there, but they couldn't override. What I want from Nest is, yeah, they have a cloud service, but they allow zero interoperability at a local peer level. Like, I, I would want to create a rule that says, what's my Nest thermostat? I want to do something else. I want to create some other data. The only API you can talk to them is through their cloud. But That's oh, honest to God, so not when, when, you run, when you're able to run a thermostat, do you blame them for the liability issues? Oh, not, I mean, that, that's their approach. They were saying, we're going to create enough of these devices, and the devices they picked are of high enough importance that the vertical use case model is strong, and so they, they can get away with it. But these cheaper devices like outlets and buttons and things like that, yeah. you, don't Some, want all that you don't want layer. all of that going to the so, cloud. So yeah. here, here's a question. So. Um, <laughs> Imagine for a second that Google is going to make some progress in the IoT market and has more and more devices like the Nest all over the place and they get some market share, right? Which is a reasonable assumption. And there's some other big companies that do that, like Amazon, for example, pushing pretty hard, right, into this. And there's a few of them. Let's say you buy a bunch of them. T uh, how likely do you, th who thinks that it is very likely that on balance, most of these devices from most of these vendors will interoperate most of the time? I see half a hand. <laughs> <laughs> My personal take is that it is about as likely that these things end up operate as likely as it is that Twitter and Facebook get along. I'll All right? It used to be. Uh, I, uh, I have a question for you on okay. that front that I want you guys to address, which my favorite, uh, my, my biggest pet peeve in the siloed uh -huh. approach is video communications. Like my son, through his <coughs> life's brother has a port, a Facebook portal. I don't have a Facebook portal. My mom has the Echo Show. I don't have the Echo. <laughs> I don't have the Echo. <laughs> like, and, uh, and I have an iPhone and somebody else has a, like, we can't talk to each other. Plus, not only can we not talk to each other directly through these devices you want to talk, the, the ones with the big screen, so I have to talk to them always through some little app on my phone to communicate. No. Why can't there be an independent, like Nextcloud-like, where you just publish, you use <coughs> TV as the screen, you have a little camera sitting on top of it that looks out at your couch where you're always sitting. Like, I want to sit in front of my couch right. and but talk to you all know. of my relatives but without having some service provider. I just want to, like, like right. direct. But the answer for that one is very simple. Why that is, is because it's contrary to the business strategy of all those guys, right? But the what reason it take why to build that. Yeah, why but but, that but so see, that, see, if you look at the history of Twitter, for example, right? Uh, when they when they started out, it was be as open as possible. Anybody could connect, right? We had a ton of different Twitter clients, all of that. And at some point, they became bigger, and they cut them all off. 
right? Then they bought Tweedy and all of that because that's the way these platform strategies work. And if we work there, we would follow the same strategy because that's the logic of the business. The problem in the IoT is what that means is that my house will have to become either a Google house or an Amazon house, or an Apple but house. I or an Apple house. Yeah. But I will not be able to have a functioning house for multiple vendors. Now here is how it is going to go like five years or 10 years down the road, you're going to put into your newspaper, should it still exist, I'm going to sell my house, um, requires a Google account in good standing. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody, when I say that, everybody is laughing, but this is exactly what it happens. You know, if, if you are installing 100 devices that only talk to the Google silo or any other, if you don't want to pick on Google specifically, right? Practically, if your teenage son now goes and does something that Google deems to be illegal, okay, you get kicked off that account and your house is non-functional. I mean, so far that hasn't happened in the IoT world, but it has happened with, uh, with Google accounts. There's, you know, if you look around, there's so many people who lost half of their professional life because uh, Gmail went away and all the events went away and all of that. And there is no remedy. You know, we have no remedy for this one. There's no appeals process. There's nothing you can do. So is that really where we want to be? And I think if we had an environment where you know, everybody brings the device, it's open protocols, I think that's the, envi the, the environment we want to be. And there is, just like in the Linux world, there is every possibility to build successful businesses around open source, open protocol kind of products. Just in the IoT thing, we have had very little of that. We need more of that. Yeah, I have a fear thing also. Like we just, in our last release that came out last week, have logging now. And we're, it's really important to us to show you data that's being collected locally and processed locally. And so you can see it before you decide to share it with service providers, you know. And, and one guy that's on our team said his wife saw the data of something she'd been using and, and was imagining that data in the wrong hands is just a <laughs> fingerprint for when, to, when nobody's home, like when nobody's right. in the home. And if that were hacks like credit card companies get, or, or companies like online shopping and their credit cards get hacked if an online source of all your home habits in the wrong hands, that's also a bad thing. So we have to really compartmentalize the data. It's not just, it's not that you can't store some data here and there, but all in the power of a few companies, would, in my opinion, is not a good idea. Yeah, so if I'm making uh, edge devices at home, even using the ESP, do you guys provide the, the firmware that you're talking about with the MDS? I'm just in the MQTT Oh, yeah, now. so, so, so. in uh, iot.mozilla.org has under community the link to our GitHub, which is just mozilla-iot. We've tried to make as many open source libraries for different languages. So there's WebThing Arduino, WebThing you know, Microblocks as WebThing libraries, WebThing Rust, WebThing Java, WebThing Node, WebThing Python, WebThing MicroPython, WebThing Modable. Peter was supposed to be here. They have JavaScript for these microcontrollers, um, which is pretty cool for some like appliances. You can have not only a touch screen that's local, that works locally, but it's also producing these data so that uh, like energy monitoring or other things where the water pipe broke and you want to shut off your washing machine, you right. whatever. I, I, you know, I, I think you, you point, uh, your, your, your comment goes in the direction of that well, look at this. I could actually build a little device and I only have to do the things that are specific to my device and the rest comes for free because somebody else built it there already against open protocols. Right? Before the web, if you had to build a, 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 web, a, a, a network-based application, you had to build the client and the server. Remember? <laughs> right? Then the web, you didn't have to deal with, with that client anymore. It, it, it was there. The, the, the customers had it already installed. Hey, isn't that cool? We can do the same thing. Imagine if you had somebody else's mobile phone app that you could use. If the, all you want to do is add a sensor that's you know, specific to whatever your particular uh, circumstances are. That'd be very cool. I think, I think I also wanted to compare the cost. Uh -huh. These 433 megahertz devices, I can get four packs of these for the price of one that connects to the internet. And these alarms and door sensors and remote controls, dirt cheap. Why? Because they're not hosting a cloud service and they're not hosting a smartphone app and all that other stuff. They just sell you this thing. And they're so completely we can, unsecured. 
<laughs> that's okay. These are insecure. Yeah, they're completely insecure. But if you had, like, if you add the security chip and the security and a secure protocol of wireless, this still it's just the so hardware itself. Not having a maintenance of a cloud service, not having smart. Oh no, I, I get that trade-off. I think these should be cheaper in general. Yeah, yeah, I think. Oh, good. Uh, I think the uh, security should also be part of some kind of uh, protocol, um, so that the, in the IoT comes up with some protocol. Um, I, I see that um, locks and thermostats from Nest and other services are also secured, but it's it's still like if there's a flaw in there, uh, we're dependent on getting firmware upgrades from that vendor. Oh, I'm not arguing about that um, at all. I mean, they are securable. Yes. But the 433 megahertz devices yes. are not no, securable no, in any no, no. shape or form. Just no. pretend they're Wi Fi or Bluetooth, low energy, or Zigbee or Zigbee, so, whatever so, well, it is. Yeah. I actually have a 330 um, presentation on software defined radios. And yeah. last year, I did an IoT um, presentation on 433 megahertz devices which is pe why people are asking for SDR. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I illustrate how you can sniff, and, and that's something yeah, yeah, yeah. you're alluding to, is being right. a yeah. So, so on the, on the uh, I think the interesting part here is this though. This is an early market, all right? There's lots of stuff that doesn't work the way it's supposed to. The 433 things, I have a bunch of them in my house, are terrible <laughs> on a technology level, they're terrible. But they're really cheap. So the question is, can you do something useful with something that's completely insecure and terrible? Yeah, you can for some things, but only for some things. The question is now, who, who, why is this so cheap? Well, because there's a bunch of guys in China who churn them out you know, at very large volumes at a very low price. If we give them open protocols, guess what happens? They can do the same thing, this time secured and still cheap. But if they don't have the open protocols, they can't churn it out. So I, I, you had a comment. Um, you're talking about um, the... the end user case, the, the consumer case. Is uh -huh. there a commercial case? Is there a similar argument? Is there a similar momentum in the commercial space? I think there's a similar uh, case to be made. Uh, I think most IT projects are less plug and play today than they are, and they're more like, I do a project to accomplish a particular use case. It's sort of a, a, pro a project that you wrap all your arms around, and then you're done with the project somehow. We aren't in the position yet where, where where um, you know, five years into the deployment, now there's new generations of technology, we need to add all of these things, and all of a sudden open protocols become much more, product, uh, much more important. So I think it's a little early. Um, but, at least but, that's my uh, the assessment of the market. the Web of Things framework is all use cases. Most of the Web of Things industry partners are in the industrial IoT. Because so General Electric is part of the open source one versus proprietary protocols? Well, so, so being part of the W3C Web of Things doesn't mean you publish your things openly. Right. We do, but there's Oracle and Siemens and Panasonic, and they implement their thing in a proprietary way, and they do plug fest with each other, right? <laughs> there's, you know, because they only have to operate at a web layer. They don't have to say how they got that data there, so they're not necessarily sharing what they're building into their industrial stuff. There's there is some evidence that, uh, that the industrial, like IBM and Microsoft and Apple, well, maybe not Apple, I'm not sure about Apple, but they are actually publishing their patents in the public. So you can actually get a whole lot of their patents that are being made public. Same thing with Tesla. Mm -hmm. Tesla made all their patents public. If you look at um, China, you'll see a lot of uh, cars and electric cars that are just like Tesla. <laughs> you have a comment? Uh, yeah, yeah, do a do bit of education for me. Compare and contrast uh, Apple's HomeKit 1024-bit encryption to what you hope maybe someday the internet, the, the open internet of things will, will can you know, embrace as far as encryption. The short version is that the web of things is just standard web stuff. So if you think you are comfortable interacting with your bank online due to you know the entire stack that's there, there's no reason why it should be any less secure uh, in the IoT world. Okay. I think that's the short version. That's the short answer. Good. Yeah. Okay. On the web layer, it's all standard web right. encryption. So that, that, it's, it's, that in the, it's in the local. Why network is Apple network doing 1024? Because of locked secure actual security pieces like front door locks. So. You know, all of this crypto stuff has become so cheap in terms of computation um, because we have so, uh, so powerful uh, processors. You know, uh, they're adding a few more bits makes really no difference practically. <laughs> all right.
Um, the, the, the difficulty in security is not so much on the encryption part. It is on the, um, on the entire system. i give an example. I have a homegrown um, uh, Raspberry Pi system in my house that controls the pumps in my pool. I live in California. Um, and uh, it would be nice if the pool service that comes by to deal with the chemical in my pool could control this, like turn it off when they need it to, when they come by. How exactly do I enable them to do this, but not my neighbor? There's a big question. How do I identify these guys? They have rotating personnel. I can't issue a, a password to Joe, because Joe may not be there next week. Right? There's, there's a lot of complications around this that need to be solved. But I think we are about out of time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know. Anybody want? Um, we, I think the, the next event is at uh, 10.45. We can call it a day, or we can keep talking, or half the people can walk out as you like. Yeah, we, I think, thank you guys for coming, and if you have ideas coming, and uh, again, I have a more interactive show and tell tomorrow right. at 9.30. Um, Christian has a talk tomorrow. Yeah. And I have a talk, too, on a uh, personal data recovery scheme in case all, uh, your house burns down um, and you lose all your data. <clears throat> Tomorrow morning.